Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yeah? Cool. All right. <laughs> so hello. <clears throat> All right, so hands up if you have ever had to make an email template at some point in your career before. Okay, a lot of traumatized people. Um, all right, show me on your body where the email template touched you. <laughs> For me, it was yeah. So <clears throat> they're painful. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about how painful they are or why they're painful. Fortunately, you all know. Um, I don't want to relive that experience, so that's good for me. So this is what we're doing today. We're revisiting that traumatic experience and we're going to try and make it better. Um, we're going to try and move past it and make this a healing journey. Um, so this is a little bit about me. <coughs> uh, I make a lot of stuff. I, I, I am kind of like a rabbit just jumping all over the place. Um, I like to sometimes finish things. That's when I get really excited. Um, I think I've got like three things. So, we're going to be talking about why we want to do email theming, um, not why we want to make email templating good, because we all know that. Uh, we've talked about what MJML is uh, and how it solves a lot of the pain, but then we're going to look at some fun stuff. So, <clears throat> Lockie gave us a pretty good talk about theming our front-end applications, regardless of what language they're written in. We're going to be talking about theming email templates. And they're a little bit of a different beast, but in many ways they actually can be solved simpler. Um, so we're going to walk through that. <coughs> so why um, themed emails? Pretty good if you have a service that does anything white label. Um, that's, this, this isn't for everyone. Most of you are lucky enough that you're going to be dealing with a company that knows its brand has its logos, has its colors, has its images, probably has a professional photographer taking nice images. Um, and you'll just get nice things from the designer, and you turn them into a template, and you send it out. Really, really simple. But if you're doing anything white label, um, <coughs> your options, by and large, are minimize customization of email templates. Because every bit of power that you give someone to change it, in fact, this is also true of the front end. Every, every choice you give the client, um, is a choice for them to hurt themselves and to make what you made hideous. Um, most of them aren't designers. Most of them don't have in-house developers with some sensibilities. So most of the time, it'll just be an admin staff who's picking colors from a color picker and saying, that's what I want. Um, probably a brand color, preferably. But it won't necessarily work. It won't necessarily be in the right slot. Um, and you could easily end up with completely illegible designs. Or just things that look absolutely disgusting. Um, so looking at <coughs> where you could be sending out an email right now, there's Campaign Monitor, MailChimp, there's MailJet, there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch, right? But your capacity to dynamically theme those <coughs> templates is very limited, and it makes sense. You can often give them variables for colors, so you might be able to say, okay, for this client's emails, um, these are the color variables we want to send through. <clears throat> but unless you have someone curating which color variables they are, where they apply, um, you're basically just praying that they will work in an email template. And I don't like to just pray. Um, you also get a lot of vendor locking with those things. Um, I, I, I highly doubt that many of you are working with a company that doesn't have some severe vendor locking with at least some of its um, services, but I like to minimize it. Um, you'll actually save a bit of money and time. And that probably sounds crazy, because like, why on earth would you save money and time if you're not using a vendor for these things? It's, it's almost completely counterintuitive. Uh, but what I am going to show you was developed over the course of two nights, and one of those nights was just making templates. So that's from nothing to sending themed email templates. Um, six different templates, two nights. Um, so you can definitely save money and time. Um, also, it's painful, blah, 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 and okay, that's good. <coughs> so, where are we at? Um, this, is, this is where we're at. This is where we've been at forever. Uh, this is where we will be when I am old and grey. Why? All right. I'm going to actually need to... Nah, I'm not going to get to dive into that. Um, I'd like to have to connect to the internet, and then we'll all be here waiting. 
So Campaign Mother have this excellent thing that they maintain. It's a huge list of all of the CSS properties which are buggy or inconsistently supported across all current CSS clients and email clients. Um, it's pretty long. I'm only halfway through. Keeps going. I mean, you get obvious ones, right? like columns and flexbox. They're relatively modern. They've only been in browsers for the last couple of years. Um, grid, of course. Um, but if you break out any of these, like even <laughs> let's, 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 let's let's go up here for a second. Where, where is it? Look what's here. Background color. <laughs> yeah. Um, now I, I can't expand that because it has to hit up that API. I don't know who designed it, but whatever. Um, but there are two email clients in the current that have partial support. One's buggy, and the other's some other thing. Uh, background image has like four red crosses. Like I, I can't tell you the exact numbers and stuff. I was hoping to show you, but I was hoping to have internet. Um, anyway, there, there's a whole bunch in here that. Just, what? But I mean, we all know this, right? Because we've all made email templates. The entire experience is defined by. So, <clears throat> that's where we are. Oh, come on, I've got to click on it down. Alright. So, MJML. Um, Maljet Markup Language. It's a very creative name. Um, rolls off the tongue. <clears throat> it's basically React for email. So it's built on React, so it's called almost literally React for email. Um, it's component based, of course, it's better than React, it'd be very hard to move away from that. Uh, it has responsiveness built in, so the limited responsiveness that you can get with email templates with a ton of work, they've done all of it for you. Um, the styling is exposed as component attributes. And you might think, oh, gee, inline styles, component attributes, ah, oh, it's like 1990. Um, but it's actually got a pretty big advantage, because you don't need to worry about the separate style sheet. You don't have to worry about some other styling solution. You just make your template and then it works. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's extensible, of course. You can make your own components. It comes without the box, a bunch of useful ones. But <coughs> to make your own, you need to go through the pain. You need to make all of the compliant hark up and bullshit. Um, so I wouldn't do that if you can avoid it. It has a JSON API if you want to do some crazy programmatic combination of things to make your templates. It's totally unnecessary though. I'm going to show you how I do things and well, I don't know why you don't need it anymore. Um, it has a CLI, again, really useless for theming because um, nothing's dynamic, right? You just run it and you get a bunch of static HTML files with template variables, things that you throw up on your campaign model or whatever. <coughs> um, it's really good documentation. But that last point, I'm, I'm kind of serious, right? You actually don't even need to learn it. Like, I don't know it. Um, so, it lets you write this. That's that would that, that's fully complete working code that will send that will create a email for you, which will work and look not terrible. So you write that, um, and I'll just quickly go through. So MJML, that's like your your doc and your head and your HTML and all the, all the crap, right? All the dressing. Your body is your body tag. Um, the whole thing. Container is like your centered column or whatever, you can left one. Section is like a row, column to column. Text is something inside of it. You've got like image, image. Sorry? Is it responsive? Yeah, it uses, it uses column and, and section and stuff like that to do all of that. Similar to like bootstrap, right? But not disgusting. Um, so that will send that. And that's what we're familiar with, right? Who wants to write that? Hands up. Um, all right, uh, but you, you don't actually need to do any of that first part, right? So this, you don't actually need to do that at all. Um, you can just steal the template, and that's all I do. So they have a, a library, a small library of only 15 or something, I don't know, this many. Um, but they're all pretty comprehensive, and they have enough in there. You can just copy your copy, uh, copy paste your way to success, right? Um, so if you look at any of them, it shows you here. Let me see if I can make this bigger. I can. So on the left is the MJML that you would write, copy paste. And on the right is what it's going to generate. Let's keep up with the line count for a little while. <laughs> 89, 671. So I don't, I don't want to do that right side ever. 
So you can also preview. What does it look like in mobile? What does it look like on a desktop? So there's your responsiveness. I mean, this one's probably not actually didn't do anything interesting at all. But, I mean, it's not terrible. Is there anything? No, no, no. Oh, maybe something there. Yeah, there we go. Social media. Um, so yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. So my development process basically looks like this. Oh, I like what this looks like. Copy and paste and then change the things, right? Like how we all originally learned HTML when we were like 10. <laughs> like why, 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 why move past that? You, they, they, just, they just gave it to me. I don't need to do it. I don't need to know what the hell MJ column is. It's right there. It does, it does all the things I want. All right, click on that. <clears throat> all right. Um, that's all there is to say about MJML. Like, uh, it, it, it's that simple. It gives you the code, you take the code, and then you change the parts that you don't like. Okay, so, interesting stuff. <laughs> Theming it, making it cool and dynamic and work with some sort of white label. Um, all right, so it's basically problem solving at this point. Um, so you have arbitrary brand colors. And like literally arbitrary. I mean, I don't know if you've really ever looked at what your clients ever put into your products, but it's arbitrary. Um, you need to be able to use those colors on buttons and text, and backgrounds, um, on images. Um, and if you're fancy, logos can be chosen to switch based on the background color that they're on. And I'm fancy, so we're going to do that. Um, we also want reusability, so we want partials, right? Um, so that section concept, that's actually how I sort of sort of think about these templates anyway, right? I want this thing, and that's partial for me. So we turn that to something reusable. Um, and we want this because we want it so that when we send out whatever the hell we're sending out, we don't know. So I'm not a client putting all the variables. When we send it out, people can still use it and click on the buttons and we can make money. <coughs> so this is the color scheme of the Google Slides presentation I'm using right now. Uh, it was carefully selected by a designer um, to make it look cool. Uh, it has nice, subtly desaturated red and nice little, not, not lime green, it's not hideous, right? Like, it's, it's, it's okay, it works. But certain combinations of that really don't work, right? So green text on, on red, that's no, no, that's a no. Um, same with red on green. Uh, you can sort of ignore these crossbars, right? Like obviously that's where the colors just completely match up and you can't see anything. Um, but we have, you know, we have by and large some mostly usable color combinations in, the, in those fringes. Right? Um, this is colors taken from what an actual client has given me in the past. <laughs> um, so this was fun to work with. And you can immediately see that those safe color combinations aren't safe anymore. Right? So blue on black, that doesn't work. Um, yellow on white, no. A lot of that is bad. But these ones in the middle, strangely, they work. But this is by far not the worst you could get. You can get someone who gives you white, light gray, silver, and, <laughs> and some other color, usually yellow. Um, so <clears throat> the color combinations that we're given or that we allow uh, drastically change the legibility of what we're using. And if we just have a very crude variable system where people can like say, this hex color is my primary button color, and this hex color is my tip, yeah, it's not gonna work. It's just not gonna work. Right, this is what you might get from a designer in-house who's saying, here's our email template. I've carefully collected a beautiful image from Google Images, and I've crafted this to look exactly how it is. See, notice how the darkness sort of moves up here, and so this white text is totally legible. Um, you get that a lot if you have in-house designers who don't do code. Um, <coughs> so, how would we programmatically, without knowing what this image was, without knowing what these colors were, how would we figure out what's appropriate to put on this image? Um, so if we take the dominant color of the image, not quite the average color, but the dominant color, subtly different, um, then we can compare it against the colors we have available and we can see which combinations are going to give us something legible, at the very least, uh, or something 
I mean, this is obviously stands out by far on all of the colors. Um, but if the designer wants this, the designer says, this is, this is the preferred color, fall back to this if you want. We have to really think about our algorithms, right? If we're just going for highest contrast, it's always going to fall through to that one, probably in most use cases. Um, so, we, so we have to plan for these. We have to say, ah, we need a preference system. I prefer this color over this other color. But I definitely, definitely prefer contrast over not contrast. Um, and also, uh, possible logos. This is where I was saying about being fancy. Um, most of the time, you will just get a disgusting JPEG logo with a white background that you have to use. Um, God help you. Uh, but <laughs> sometimes you might be able to coerce the client into uploading a transparent PNG. Sometimes it'll be a reverse or something similarly flat color. You can use those. You can't use all that. <coughs> This is what you're going to get from a client. Right? Let's be real. That's going to be the first email sent from that template. Um, it doesn't work, I'm not going to lie. It doesn't work at all. Uh, and if we apply our algorithm, we can make it better. This is the average color. And we can clearly see here some things that we can definitely see that red does not work on this average color. Um, black is a far better choice. Um, white even. But like this is just way too low contrast. We definitely shouldn't be opting for that. Um, now, the text itself, I, I just tell designers don't put text on images, uh, straight up. But in email templates, um, you don't have all the niceties that they tend to use to put text on images. You don't have um, gradients. They don't exist. Not programmatic anymore. You can, you can make an image one, but it has to be baked onto the image. Uh, you can't like overlay your images on top of each other. That's a no. Um, and you can't do drop shadows. So all the things that would typically be used to massage this into something legible are not an option in email. Um, so the best you can do is basically just say, that's the highest contrast. I'll use that. And uh, yeah, otherwise just slap designers who put text on the images. <coughs> all right. So how are we going to solve those problems? Really limit your color palette. Uh, there are many different things that I've seen, Kevin and also stuff similar. You have like 50 different color variables, like SAS variables, and they're all like esoterically named, like input border color. Um, don't do that. That's totally unworkable. Limit it. Limit it to known quantities. Um, you don't want the problem space to be combinatorially infinite. Right? You want it to be 20 possibilities, so you can deal with it. So limit the color palette that they're allowed to have. Um, my preference, you'll see, is, is uh, to have a clearly labeled action color. So this is like the thing you want people to click on, that's the color from that. And then uh, light, mid, and dark. Um, communicating to the client what sort of color should go here. Uh, input border does not communicate what sort of color should go there. Um, so yeah, try and communicate as much information as possible. We generate some shades from those. So we've only got three, five, whatever. I'll go with four. Um, generate some shades from those. So we get some lighter versions and some darker versions. Just in case they pick colors that are too close together, we can drop them down or bump them up. Um, now what we want to do, if you remember the, the button, we want the red button when it's feasible, fall back to a white button which is obviously higher contrast later. So have a prioritized list. So first try and meet a minimum contrast ratio that we defined. For an action button, it probably should be pretty high. You probably want that to stand out. It's your most important thing. But if you meet that minimum contrast ratio, use the first one that I give you. This is my priority system. Um, fall back to the highest contrast if none of them meet. Just go for whatever you can. Treat images and logos as colors. So you get a background image generate the dominant color from it, and that's how you refer to it as a color. And then you can use an algorithm to say, this is the color of the background image, this is the colors I have available to me, which is the highest contrast, use that as on the text on top of it. Um, but also logos. So you get a logo, generate the dominant color in the logo, and say, this is the color of the logo. And now when you put that logo on top of a background color, you're talking about just a color on top of a color. It's actually referencing a logo, but you're talking about the color. You can generate contrast between colors. You can't generate contrast between logos. 
Um, and reusability, so partials, they're just functions, they take a pipeline to return a template string. The template string is in JML. Alright. <coughs> so, the data that we need to do this. I just like this. You can do other things, but I find this a, a good solution. So we want colors, again, I said action, communicate something to the user, dark, mid, light. If they put white in dark, they'd probably paint themselves into a corner for mid and light are. Um, but, eh, <laughs> they will do that. Um, images, get sort of done the color, so we can always reference them. Logos, key them by the color. I'll show you why. Just, it, this, this, is, this is the structure I've zeroed in on just on what is super easy for me to reference when making templates. All right, code time. All right, starting from the top, let's make this pretty big. Uh, I hope you don't mind word wrap. It's probably too big, but anyway. <coughs> this is very similar, MJML to HTML, that's the function you want to import from the library. Um, you call it with a template string, uh, and you get the HTML that results. It has some other crap on there, but who cares? You only ever care about the HTML. Um, now, this, is where we get fancy. Now from our brand, we had our colors object, right? Our colors object had action, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we just grab that and we throw it into this create theme function. I'll step through what, we, what we're doing. This is not necessarily the cleanest way to go through it, but this is like how you might approach it if you found the code base from fresh, right? Um, so yeah, we want to pass the theme to the template function and have the template function just stick stuff in the strings and return. <coughs> uh, that is way too big. Okay, so there's a bunch of imports. This is just importing a bunch of partials. This is actually taken from legit stuff that I have that works and sends emails in, in production. Um, so this, this is the purchase receipt template. So when someone buys something, this is the one that they get that says, you've got it, and here's your receipt. Um, so we have a bunch of partials. Um, we have our payload coming in. It's got some information we care about. I'm not going to go through that. Boring, obviously. Um, here's the theme stuff. So theme has a function called hex and a function called subtle contrast. Um, and we use those in here. So this is our MJML. Um, I've literally just replaced things from existing templates. Uh, I did not write almost any of these tags. Well, any of them, really. Um, I changed values. Uh, and it worked really well. I mean, if you want, you can learn it, but why? Um, so here's our partials. I've got a header. And I'm giving it a background color. Now, this is actually pretty dangerous outside of this system. Saying, have a background color of whatever the hell the client gave us. And then just put some text on it. We'll see how that goes, right? Text is black. Let's hope for the best. Um, so we're going to give it a background color. And I'm going to say it's going to be, in this case, secondary. Um, this is this template from production comes from an early iteration where I wasn't talking about dark mid light because I was the only one using it. Um, I used primary, secondary, and something else. But anyway, um, this is basically the same thing. And then we fall back to dark or light. So, uh, well, sorry, these are the ones we want to choose from. Secondary is our background color, and choose dark or, or light, whichever contrasts. Because we want to contrast with the next partial which is secondary, the next one is primary, and we want that one to be contrasted with either dark or light, and then the next one contrasted with either darker or lighter. So it'll be darker or lighter version of secondary, then secondary, then primary, then a darker or lighter version of primary, darker, or dark, the dark or light version of primary, the darker or lighter version of primary. Uh, so we get some banded colors. It's pretty cool. Alright, <coughs> this is one of the partials, I'm not going to go through all of them, this isn't about my templates. Um, so, in that partial, again we still get theme, we pass it the whole payload through to everything. We get the hex function, um, we get it. this time we just talk using contrast, not subtle contrast, using contrast. Um, and with shades, so these functions I'll get to, but this is how they're used. So again, the background colour is just the background colour that we pass through from the top. So in this case it's um, probably secondary dark or secondary light. And we just turn it into hex, um, to, you know, the scale stuff. This is just variables you can pass through, like sizing and stuff. Um, all right, so here's something interesting. So the logo is a map of images keyed by hex. 
So we want to choose from the logo the hex value which contrasts with the background color. The, op the colors you can check against are all the available colors of the logo. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so in my application right now, I actually only have two, white and orange, um, because those are the colors of my brand that I want to be seen on the templates. Um, but it will go through and say, okay, check white, check orange, pick the highest contrast with the background color, choose that logo URL, and then there you go. So I can choose different, color, different logos based on background colors. Um, and then down here, the color of this text, contrast against the background color, that's a pretty common theme, right? Like I don't want them to be contrasted against itself. Um, and then with shades, light, primary, um, so this is me partially moving towards a new system. Um, four, theme generator. So what we're looking at is this, this is theme. X takes flexible input is just a uh, function. I use a lot of functional programs. And you can see a lot of composition of functions. You might be like, what the fuck is going on? Um, but they're named relatively sim so, simply so. Flexible input just means that you can give it a hex string, you can give it a RGB array, uh, or you can give it the name of the color. And it will try and look up the name of the color. If it doesn't get it, or if it's an array, it will choose the array. And if it's a hex string, it will try and parse it into an RGB array. But ultimately, under the hood, it's always using an RGB array. Um, so turn it into hex, simple. So with shades, is just with shades. Uh, take all of the color names and iterate through them, reducing down to the name with the shade. So secondary dark, secondary light, darker, lighter, darkest, lightest. And that gives us an order of precedence, so we can say, try and find the highest contrast, keep going through these until you get the best one. Obviously put the highest contrast ones, darkest and lightest, at the end, if they're at the beginning, you know, they're always going to be chosen. Um, so we get our shades, that's what we're using like here to say, you know, use these colors. Um, contrast is actually best contrast, and best contrast is Minimum contrast, then fall back to maximum contrast. So these ratios are based on the WCAG recommendations for accessibility. Um, 4.5 is your AA, I think. 7 is your AAA. Uh, we have a 7 down here for high contrast. And we have a subtle contrast, which says, yeah, 2 is fine. So we can use that for background colors, but not so much for text. Right, so that's why I have subtle contrast in here, subtle contrast, because these are the background colors. So we can pick the first one that is at least two contrast, um, and not just always go to the Wow. Oh, we still got power TVs, that's good. That's good. <laughs> this is so much more intimate. Ah. Um, all right. And max contrast, obviously, we'll just always pick the maximum contrast. Um, you probably want to use that for buttons and stuff. But these are just handy helper functions, right? They're just <coughs> doing, ultimately, a contrast ratio check against the colors that you've given them. I'm not going to go through all these functions because it will just <laughs> confuse the crap out of everyone. Um, but yeah, contrast ratio, background, current color, is it greater than the ratio that I'm using? If it is, use that one. If it's not, go to the next one. Um, cool. Yeah, I don't think there's anything else of value in there. It's all just composition of all of that. Yeah, find the maximum. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Uh, and the shades. So shades, not trivial, but like pretty, pretty simple. So we have deltas of shades. So how much darker is darkest? How much darker is dark? How much lighter is light? So on. Um, now that's not. It's not an absolute number in the sense that it doesn't mean anything. Um, it's just what I've found to work. <coughs> so to generate our shades, which we did in the previous one, um, we just reduce over our shades, blah, 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 blah. Naming them accordingly, so primary, dark, whatever. Um, we tint them um, with whatever the shade was. So the thing to, to keep in mind if you want to implement this yourself, um, convert to a color space that makes sense for this. RGB is a terrible color space for manipulating a shade. 
you have to programmatically know how much red, how much green, how much blue to adjust. Uh, and they are not perceptually the same. Um, blue is a much darker visual colour. Green is a much lighter visual colour. So if you move them all by like five, you will screw up the colour a lot. Um, so convert to HSL, hue, saturation, lightness. That's the one we care about. Tint it, and then convert back to RGB. Uh, and when you're tinting it, you need to understand what the hell L is. So L is your lightness, and you want to adjust it more if you're going darker from white than if you're going darker from like dark, dark grey. Yeah? Perceptually, the middle band needs to move the most, and the higher ends and the lower end need to move less. So you need to proportionally adjust. That's why this isn't any absolute thing. This is all very wishy-washy. But you can implement basically the same thing. I'm just telling you so that if you want to do it yourself, proportionally adjust the shades. If you try and do it absolutely by like five points for this, five points for that, it'll look absolutely terrible. Um, and when you get to the higher range, you'll immediately clip. Um, so you, you go beyond 100 immediately. Um, so that, that's basically it. All right. Uh, we'll go back here. And what's next? That's right. All right. So I'm going to finish up by showing you actual email templates that have been built using this. Um, let's see. Where do I start? Four, five. Five. Cool. Let's make it bigger. So this is for a game um, that I am making that is in late prototype phase. It's not yet released, but this is what the receipt email will look like when it is. Um, so it's got a logo, it's got my business logo, receipt, blah, 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 all this sort of stuff. <coughs> and all these colours are chosen by the theme. Let's see, am I at five or six? Okay. Here's another one. So these are two games. That one and that one. Now, mostly you might be looking at it and go, oh, that's actually pretty trivial. But there's one thing changing between the two that is programmatic, and that's the colour of the text on the button. Um, so here, white is not contrasty enough on light blue compared to white on red, which is much higher contrast. So it goes for the darker colour. Um, so that's the first part where you go, oh, there's some, something programmatic happening. However, the reason they're so similar otherwise in how they present is because I'm a designer and I carefully chose these colours, right? Like this wasn't just given to someone who works in admin. Um, here's what would happen if all of the colours were white except the button. They're all 100% white. So it's choosing darker shades of white. Um, totally legible. Now if this button were white, that would not be legible. Just because of the way I've made the template right now, it's the assumption that if you're going to give an action colour, you're going to want that to be your main thing. Please don't be stupid about it. But going forward, I could definitely just adjust that, say, fall back to these other contrasting colours. But all three other colours there are pure white. All three other colours are pure black. So it's legible. So those numbers, that 24, 15, 8, those are being applied to create the shades. Now I can make those numbers bigger if I think that this isn't enough contrast. And frankly, if someone's going to put, like if they're an edge lord and they're just like, oh, it's dark like my soul then they're probably trying to market to a crowd who's going to be okay with seeing dark grey text on a black background. But otherwise, you can just adjust those numbers, right? You can just bump 24 to 30, and then that'll be more contrasting. Uh, and just for giggles, this is uh, the brand colours from the Google slide. Did I just threw in just, just because. Uh, I don't think it looks good, but uh, I just threw it in. Uh, and that works, right? I mean, black and white works, so everything all but that's themed according to the Google slide. And that's me. So, so DVD is open. Um, I'm doing, hoping to do a talk on event sourcing. I gave it to CampJS. If you didn't go to CampJS, and you wish you did, vote for it. If you did go to CampJS, you obviously know it's awesome, so vote for it. 
Um, yeah, it's hard to find because there's like a million things, so just search for my name. Just vote eight times. <laughs>